Good evening. It feels like evening, doesn't it? It's gone quite dark now up here. Um, my name is Emma Baltry. I'm the Senior Clinical Research Dietitian. I'm based at Leicester General Hospital at the Diabetes Research Centre. I've worked in Leicester as a community dietitian. Um, I went to do my PhD over at Nottingham and came back to work in research. And I've, I'm primarily interested in weight management in people with chronic diseases and multimorbidity. And my PhD work was working with people with severe obesity. So um, I've sort of extended that scope into other chronic diseases. And my interest in diabetes um, and diabetes reversal is because we've actually done some work on that at the Diabetes Centre. I'm happy to interact. It always makes it much more fun if it's not just me talking for half an hour. Um, we've got about 30 minutes or so of presentation. And then there's an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if though through, the, through the, the presentation you feel like there's something absolutely you need to know, then just let me know. You know we'll work with it. Because I'm sure if you really want to know, probably the person next to you also wants to know. Uh, I can't guarantee you'll have the answer, mind, but uh, I'll do my best. And failing that, we'll find a reference for you somewhere. Okay. Um, I've aimed this at um, a, the general public, which means that Although I've got some references in here and some academic papers, I'm trying to talk to you as I would do um, my husband, who's also in the audience. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so if he, if he doesn't grasp it, then you know, apologies. Um, I've tried to aim it so that people would grasp it. And I'm trying to make it relevant to you as people. So not just academic speak and not just lots of statistics, which, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't remember anyway. So uh, in terms of what we're going to cover, there's three, three sections to the presentation. And what I really hope is that I'm going to have a short pause in between each and that we'll take a breath, have a little bit of a summary before we move on to the next one. Especially if you're sitting down, because we'll have a little bit of a break, maybe have a bit of a movement. So I'm talking about diabetes risk to start with. The reason I'm talking about diabetes risk is because the same reasons that people get diabetes are the same reasons that people might be able to reverse or put diabetes into remission. So the reasons we're looking at risks are the reason we're looking at remission and, and reversing. We then go on to what does reversing type 2 diabetes look like in terms of the evidence base. We look at also remission in the real world. So we look at the sort of things that can affect whether somebody can achieve remission, if it is possible. And by the end of this, Hopefully you'll be able to decide for yourselves who that could look like. Is that everybody who has type 2 diabetes? Is it just some people? And would you be able to know that yourself if you were thinking about this from a personal perspective? Okay. So there's my three bits. So firstly, some people have been here already for a few minutes. So just to get a little bit of, of blood flowing, can we have a little bit of a Mexican wave, please? So from the, from the front here... I'm going to start it, and we can go that way, please. So, Do you want to start okay. Up or? No, no, just, no, just, just your arms is okay. fine. So, Mexican wave from the front to the back. Come on. That wasn't terribly coordinated. Was it? <laughs> Let's give it another go. Okay, so on three. There we go. Lovely, and on the way back. Fantastic. Okay. So, if you've if you've ever been in any of these lectures and you've sat for more than ten minutes, you know you start blurring words and things don't make sense. So, yeah. Um, make sure that blood is flowing. We might get you up next time. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> oh dear, sorry. I know. Yeah. We'll blame the lady in the front row. Um, so, type 2 diabetes risk. What puts you at risk of developing type 2 diabetes? What we're looking at is a timeline from somebody who isn't somebody with type 2 diabetes to the timeline of saying, I have type 2 diabetes and being diagnosed. Now, there's lots of blurry lines in the middle of this. Words like borderline, pre-diabetes, yeah. So we look at things like impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, and we're looking at why people move from not having diabetes to having diabetes. Okay. So, first things first. This is just an image which I have pinched, so please don't copy it. It is copyright. Yeah, I'm already in trouble. Slide one. Um, this just gives you an idea of the sort of things that might feed into your own personal risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Yeah? Um, I've also got a list here of some of the factors. 
Some of these are modifiable. So in other words, some things you can actually change. I've always wanted to change my family, never actually achieved that. Uh, physical inactivity, high blood pressure, increasing age, yeah. If I had the answer to that one, <laughs> yeah, I'd, have, I, I'd be worth a million. Impaired glucose tolerance, ethnicity, history of gestational diabetes, and one at the bottom, overweight. Yeah. So I've just listed eight factors there that can influence whether or not you're likely to develop type 2 diabetes. Some of those you can impact, some of those you can't. Yeah? So I've got eight in the list. How many do you think are modifiable? How many can you change yourself? Can we change two of those? Well, it's probably not. It's probably not. Okay. I'm going to do a Brucey moment. So higher or lower than two, modifiable. Higher, higher. So we've got three. Higher than three? Oh, we've got a sticker over here. Yeah. We've now turned into stick and twist. We think three, maybe four? We think four. Yeah, okay, we'll go for four. Go for four. So what that gives you an indicator of, although there are things we can't do anything about, I mean, we may have had gestational diabetes, obviously not the gentleman in the room. Um, we may have a certain ethnicity, which puts us increased risk, we may have increasing age, again, can't do anything about that, and apologies. But the things that we can do something about, the modifiable risk factors, are those sort of things that we can then feed into whether or not we develop type 2 diabetes. If you want to check yourself out, if you're interested, or anybody else you know is interested in whether or not they can develop type 2 diabetes, there is a free online risk tool. It's been developed with Diabetes UK and with Diabetes Research Centre, University of Leicester. And you can have a look at it, you can put in your own details, you know, your anthropometric measures, put in your weight, put in your gender, and it will give you an idea of your risk in categories. Are you at high risk? Should you do something about it now? Moderate risk, low risk. So, if anybody's interested, uh, just for reference, these slides will be available with the presentation on the website afterwards, so don't panic if you don't get everything written down. You didn't know there was a test later, though, did you? <laughs> okay, so of these modifiable risk factors, the one that I'm focusing on this evening is body weight. Okay, body weight. Why body weight? What does body weight, what is it made up of? What are we, essentially? Okay, this is me as a thinker. Yeah. So, what do you think makes up most of our body weight? Water. <laughs> Some would say I've got quite a lot of that up here. Um, in terms of what do we mean by body weight? Absolutely. There's obviously the skeletal structure. Yeah. Your skeleton wrapped around that. I do love an image. I do love a picture. Wrapped around that, we've got a bit of fat, maybe. We've got muscles, we've got tendons, organs. They all fit into this. I mean, without the skeleton, we'd all just flop down. But basically, within that structure, images are fantastic for this because it tells you what makes up your body. And if you're thinking about body weight risk and type 2 diabetes, which sort of things in that makeup do you think makes a difference? Is it your skeleton? Muscular structure as opposed muscles, to fat. Muscles, muscles. Oh, oh, oh. Steady on. We've got ratio here. Okay, so muddle, we've got muscle to fat ratio. Yeah? We think maybe the effect of how, many, how much fat we've got as opposed to how much, in this, we're thinking about lean mass. Lean means muscle, it means <coughs> bones, it means organs, theoretically. Yeah? Is it a problem if we have fat? We have some fat? Don't we all have a bit of fat? Is it a problem that we have fat? Depends where it is. See, it was a leading question, wasn't it? Yeah, so it depends where it is. This is where, again, these images are fantastic. I just put this up there for those of us who of, of a gender. Um, this is uh, unfortunately not gender equality in terms of fat mass. We do have a higher percentage no matter what we do. Sorry about that, ladies. It also affects our ability to manage alcohol. Um, that's a totally different point. Um, but if you look at these images, you can see here, from the yellow to the pink, we've got the 
the fat, and then we got to the bone, which is the glue. Jack, arriving late, thank you. <laughs> so in terms of your DEXA scan, at that moment Jack arrives, and there's a DEXA scan on the screen. Um, he, is the per he is the person over at the Light Vista Diabetes Centre who will be involved in DEXA scan, ironically. Um, so in terms of the scan, what we can do is actually look at what's on the inside. Because we've said it might not just be where the fat, what the fat is, that you've got fat, but where it is. So using a DEXA scan, you actually can identify where it is. So you might have fat under the skin, subcutaneous. You might have some around the organs, might be visceral, internal. You might actually have some fat inside the organs. Can we have an ooh at that point, please? So it's that sort of fat which isn't necessarily in the right place which can help things go wrong. <laughs> Subcutaneous, under the skin, might be okay. Might have a bit around the organs, you know, but definitely not, you want too, don't want too much actually in the organs themselves, do you? Yeah? So when we think about type 2 diabetes risk, I've got some examples of people who don't have type 2 diabetes and what their relationship was in terms of their diabetes risk. So there's three different studies, in other words, three things that have been published with different people looking at their risk and whether or not they're likely to get type 2 diabetes. So in this particular example, over 33,000 people were followed for 10 years. You can see the three lines there, the different body mass index categories. We can all debate the joys and difficulties of body mass index at a later date. But in terms of categories, you can see in the middle here, there's a block which says that people don't change weight. If you look to one side, this is losing weight. If you look to the other side, that's increasing weight. That's the block in the middle about where they don't really change weight. And you can see that people who have uh, this one, so we've got 25 to 30, so that's the overweight towards obese category. That's the dotted line in orange. Yeah. So if they lose weight, this is their risk. If they increase weight, what does that tell you there? That it's higher to the right where people have put weight on. So they've got the risk here is lower as it goes up yeah. as the weight increases. If you've got a bigger body weight, you see a very similar line. Yeah. So that, that was 10 years over 33,000 people. Another example, preview, another study, and again, all these references are at the end of the presentation if you really, really want to look them up. Um, over 2,000 people. So in terms of what this study looked at, it looked at people who hadn't yet developed type 2 diabetes. So when we're talking about people who haven't quite got there yet, we're talking about IFG and IGT. I love an acronym, I absolutely don't. So, impaired fasting glucose. What does that mean? Impaired. Not Does it really work? Okay. Fasting, what we do every night, yeah, unless people out here are snackers every evening. Um, and glucose, so blood sugars. Yeah. So it basically means if you have nothing overnight, your fasting glucose isn't quite as well managed as it should be. Yeah. If you then look at impaired glucose tolerance, spans it a bit more, because it's not just fasting, it also means that after you've had something to eat, the response to that glucose isn't quite as effective. So it's not just the background if I'm fasting, it's also the response to a meal. So your impaired glucose tolerance. You don't tolerate glucose as well as you, as you, you ought to, but you haven't quite got type 2 diabetes. So it talks about the people, and it says if they followed weight loss and they achieved about 36% of them <coughs> reverted to normoglycemia. Good word, I think they've made that up. <laughs> it just means within a normal range, if you like. So we're going backwards. We're moving away from type 2 diabetes. We're reducing our risk. Yeah. This actually increased to 40% when people achieved more than 8% body weight loss. So people who were at risk, who had impaired fasting, impaired glucose tolerance, so things didn't work quite as well, lost weight, they actually improved that, went to normal glycemia, <coughs> within normal ranges. 
Last example, bariatric surgery. Now this is for people who are usually quite old figure, so severely obese, and it's looking at people over 15 years. First thing to point out here, which I'm sure somebody will do, is academic, academic paper. We started out with 1,700 people in each group and it dropped down to about 400, so there are limitations. With <laughs> if you're looking at the two lines, the orange line is below the, the blue line. If you look at the right-hand side, these are the number of people who developed type 2 diabetes after 15 years. So the blue line is the people who are in the control group, and it's much higher than the people who had bariatric surgery. The main thing about bariatric surgery is the significant weight loss post-bariatric surgery. So in terms of that, over three times the number of people developed type 2 diabetes who didn't have surgery. Okay, so this is before people have, have got type 2. So we, we're setting a scene. We're saying these people could develop type 2, but they've done something about it. They can reverse that with weight loss. Okay. So this is like an overall... Um, in terms of a graph, again, do like a picture, a thousand words and all that. So what we've got is a nice curve. Yeah? It took me ages to get that to match the line. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how long it took me to do that. Um, if you look at people who are overweight or obese, and they look at how much you can reduce your weight by, if you look at the bottom here, so if we reduce our weight by 20%, um, we look up to the line here and we work our way across, almost 75% of that risk of developing type 2 diabetes has gone. Yeah? So it's quite significant. And that's 20% reduction. If you actually have 10% reduction, we work our way up and work our way across, it's almost 50%. So 10% weight reduction reduces our uh, risk of getting type 2 diabetes by half. Yeah? And I'm just going to summarise this bit, so end of the first section. The theories behind it, so if you think about body composition, you think about fat, where is the fat stored? If the fat is in the wrong place, what is it going to affect? Think about the fact that it's in the organs, it's getting in the way of, it, of them working effectively. Um, Roy Taylor, who we'll come on to in terms of the direct study, has a, a theory which is about an individual personal fat threshold. I have a fat threshold. You've got fat we don't all have the same fat threshold necessarily. So we don't necessarily all see the same result when we try something. But if we actually manage to lose this weight, can we, in this, this instance, reduce our risk of developing type 2? Yeah? So that's the first point. Okay. I've been sitting for a while. You know what's coming. <laughs> I'm going to go over this way. I think we should have a, a, a make some weight to this side this time. So make some weight to this side. Off we go. And all the way back. Oh, we lost the few that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're still there. It's all good. It's all going. Excellent. Yep. We've got the blood flowing again. Marvellous. So this bit is about reversing. We've done the, we haven't quite got to diabetes yet. We've now got, oh, I've got diabetes. Can I go that way? Yeah? That way. So, there are four studies that I'm just going to briefly describe to you. Direct. Can I have a show of hands? Who has heard, apart from that I just mentioned it, of the direct study? Or a few people. Yeah. Droplet. Anybody heard of droplet? It's a water thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. fat. Droplet. Okay. Addition. Anybody heard of addition? Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much, Annette. Not on my own. Thank you. Um, and the last one was published last week. Can we have an ooh? Mm -hmm. So, on insulin, um, basically, there was a study done in Imperial, run by Gary Frost and Adrian Brown, who is a dietitian. Go dietitians. And they looked at people with type 2 diabetes on insulin. Ooh, I'm going to leave that one to the end tension, so build up the tension for that one, okay. So direct, the one that most people have heard about, direct set out to try and produce remission in people who had type 2 diabetes. So people who had type 2 diabetes, can we get them out of what you would know as type 2 diabetes? In other words, off medication 
and in what they call normoglycemia. Yeah, we've come across that now, we know what that is. <coughs> After one year, just under half participants who achieved significant weight loss, and I say significant, you know, um, we're talking 10 to 15 kilos, 10 to 15 percent. I can use both terms because they were around 100 kilos when they started, but just so you know, you can use both terms. Um, at 24 months, so two years, about a third of people still achieve remission. Yeah? Big caveat, big caveat. How long had these people had type 2 diabetes when they started? Is this generalizable? The people on this study were mainly white and did not have diabetes for very long. Okay, so bear that in mind. I see, Just I see released how um, after these 24 months, is there any data on how they... That's, that's literally came out last year, so give him a chance. Undoubtedly he will, because knowing Roy, he will. Yeah, he's wringing every bit of publicity out of it he can, so... Yeah, watch that space. His, his website's very good, if anybody's interested. University of Newcastle website, you just ping direct, with lots of links. So what does this look like in graphs? Because I like a bit of a graph, as you know. So if you think about people who've achieved remission, percentage, interestingly, in the control group, oh no, for a randomised control trial, what do we do? In the control group, some people achieve remission. <laughs> It's almost like that placebo effect. They're part of the study. You know, they suddenly got an inkling that they should do something about this. You know, that's what happens. If you then have the intervention, so people who followed a low energy diet, just over 800 calories a day. Again, can I have a new? 800 calories. Do you know what that looks like? Starvation. Starvation. A, a Mars bar and a coffee. That's it. A grape. A little more than one grape. Probably a group of grapes. So in terms of the, what they achieved, 45.6% in year one achieved remission. That dropped. Why did that drop? They couldn't sustain it. They couldn't sustain it. What didn't they sustain? The weight loss. The weight loss. So that fat threshold, that personal fat, I've got that fat threshold. If I pass over that threshold again, do I go back where I was? So this is where the debate happens. Have they reversed diabetes? Have they put it into remission? Where does this... this I don't this think you can reverse it. It's remission. I like a controversial opinion. Yeah. So it's remission. Yeah, but if I, have star, if I have a slice of bread, my blood sugars go up. Okay. So we'll look at the, the actual definition of remission in a, little, in a, in a while. I realise I'm running over, so I'm apologising. Apologising. It's six o'clock for anybody who's with me. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. Marvellous. Okay. This second graph shows you what happens as people change. So the blue line at the top, they didn't achieve any remission. You can see this is weight change. So hardly any weight change, no remission. The second blue line, oh, we got a good dip here, and they've achieved remission at 12 months, but then, whoops, went back up. So popped back out of remission again. Yeah. The red line, first red line, achieved remission, not quite. You can see there's a little bit of difference there. But then they got to 24 months and achieved remission. Woohoo for those people. They actually, you know, in terms of the trend of not being able to achieve remission at 24 months, they're actually bucking the trend. Good for them. And then the last line, they absolutely achieved remission, all that weight loss, but 15%, 15 kilos. And then it went back up, still in remission. So that's direct. Droplet didn't set out to put people into remission, but it's running primary care run through doctors, your GPs, and actually the point was with this study that they managed to achieve that 10% that you might be able to manage to get to into remission. And 45% of the participants in the TDR group, again, apologies, acronym, total dietary replacement. So in other words, they didn't have normal foods, they had packets. Just over 800 calories again. They achieved over 10% or 10 kilos weight loss. So again, another study which says it is possible, but this isn't, again, quite short term, up to about 12 months. Addition, different group of people. These are actually what they call screen detected. So in other words, people didn't have 
di didn't know they had diabetes. They were screened and identified as having diabetes. And at that point, they went, excuse me, you've got diabetes. Do you want to do something about it now? And they were quite early on in their diagnosis. And they actually achieved quite a lot significant weight loss, but not through that severe, I'm going to underline this bit, extreme calorie restriction. Okay. There's hope for the rest of us. So no extreme calorie restriction, but still significant weight loss was needed for people to get into, into remission. Okay. On insulin, I should have built the tension up a little more for this, I realise. This is 90 people. Duration of diabetes, look, can we have an ooh? 12 to 13 years. Ooh. So this is people who've had diabetes a while, been on insulin at least four years. Now, if you know anything about how treatment progresses, people go on to insulin a bit later. They don't go on to insulin usually at the start. They have lots of other medications and lifestyle things. They had, to, again, 12-week total diet replacement, replaced all the foods, same sort of just over 800 calories, resulting in significant weight loss. We've got that 10 again, 9.8. Is that funny? We've got that 10 again, yeah. Um, what they didn't achieve was remission. Nowhere in this paper will you find the word remission related to these particular people. What you will find is they reduce their insulin burden, which for people who've had diabetes for 12 to 13 years is significant. You know, I've had diabetes a long time. Actually, I've managed to come off insulin. Some people came off it completely. And the others reduced insulin. So that's actually significant for them. Hello. <laughs> so those are the studies talking about remission. And that's the latest one that came out. And again, the references are all at the end if you're interested. But uh, Gary Frost at Imperial was the lead researcher on that one. This is what it looks like in terms of graph. So you can see the change in weight. These are people on the control arm. These are people um, on the diet. You can see the drop during the three months of total dietary replacement and then the, the maintenance phase. And then you can see the insulin dose here drops. The most important thing with anybody with type 2 diabetes who goes on to a low energy diet is medications management. If you're on insulin, you need it managed. You need to, to reduce it fundamentally. If you ha are on uh, a drug which lowers your blood glucose, you need that altered before you start the diet. If you're on blood pressure medications, you need that altered before you start the diet. Medications management is really important. And I'm going to be really, really shameless and say that we have a publication coming out in diabetic medicine in the next week, in fact it's online now, with um, medications management for people in primary care. So people in primary care who want to manage people on low energy diets, it will be published in diabetic medicine online currently. That was very well timed, wasn't it? So, so in the real world, my last points, do we need another wave? <laughs> on this side, okay? Wave! Oh, we're really getting it now. I'm very impressed by the end. <laughs> Absolutely. So last, last little bit. Now this is about real world. So we've seen the evidence. We've said that lots of things make a difference. Where the fat is stored makes a difference. How much body weight you have and how much you lose makes a difference. But there's got to be a real world element to this. Because these studies, although they were carried out in primary care and a lot of people were involved in them, a lot of, um, in terms of the support people had, it can make a difference. Thinking about elements of the real world. So, this is my real world guy. Looking very unimpressed at what he's reading. So, we're just going to look at defining remission and that debate about reversal remission and responders and non responders. The clinical definition of remission. So, if somebody has Remission is an absence of signs or symptoms of disease. So actually, if somebody is off diabetes medication, they've been off it for a while, they've had significant weight loss, you can actually achieve remission. And there is a defined uh, a definition which is available, mm -hmm. which is through the ABCD, sorry, acronyms world. Um, and I've got that on the next slide. But basically, what you're looking for is fasting plasma glucose below the diagnostic threshold for people to have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. It makes sense, doesn't it? If you're in remission, you don't have type 2, you can't have two things. Yeah. So this is what they basically describe. This is Roy Taylor's consensus document on what remission actually is. HbA1c, everybody loves HbA1c. No? 
Anybody here know what HP Hamilton means? Peace, peace, yeah, hemoglobin is definitely in there somewhere. Oh, glycated. Yeah. So you get glucose and it sticks to your red blood cells. Basically. And it's all about how long your red blood cells live as to how much glucose gets attached to it. And they look at that and they go, oh, you've got a lot of glucose attached to your blood cells. You've got diabetes. Yeah. So that's the threshold for you being diagnosed through that method. So if you're less than 48, you don't have diabetes. Um, after weight loss, because we've just seen significant weight loss is essential. You can't achieve remission without significant weight loss. And you can't have glucose lowering therapies because that would be cheating. How could you have remission if, you, if you're actually having therapies? So off therapies, six months or longer. So where do responders and non-responders come into this? Okay, we've looked at the sort of physiological things. We'll just look at that briefly. There are also other things that can impact whether you are a responder to remission. Most importantly, look at this from an individual perspective, from your perspective. First of all, think about your risk factors. Think about your body weight, think about your ethnicity, think about how you're gonna manage this weight loss process. How about all in your mind as I'm going through these? So, this is from Roy Taylor's paper. Again, excellent if you want to have a look, have a look at it. I like the pictures, personally. Always helps. So you have type 2 diabetes, you have effective weight loss, you have people who respond, you have people who don't respond. Yeah? What's the difference? The people who, both of them, have fat in the liver, and with significant weight loss, you reduce the fat in the liver. It means the liver can work. Woohoo! Liver's excited. Yeah? Pancreas fat falls in both. That's even more fundamental, isn't it? Your pancreas is fundamental to having type 2 diabetes. So you can reduce the fat in your pancreas. Woohoo! Yeah, your pancreas is excited. Yeah? But, can we have a new? But, glucose stimulated acute insulin secretion returns only in, yeah, okay, we'll cut to the chase. So basically, in people who don't respond, your beta cells, which are in your pancreas, don't work as well as they should do. And basically, you can't get that back. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try. But it does mean that some people won't actually respond. Yeah? So this just tells you, in this really pithy little quote, which I'm not going to read, um, basically what he's talking about. In the diagrams, it shows you the responders and the non-responders. You can tell which is which. So the non-responders is a little dotty line. The responders is a solid line. And it talks about weight. You can see the weight goes down in both. Your glucose response in the responders comes down, but in the non-responders it doesn't. And the same with your HbA1c. Yeah. So you both lose weight. Pancreas, woohoo! Liver, woohoo! But it doesn't actually necessarily work out in terms of your blood glucose levels. Yeah. So in the real world, we're in the real world. Yeah. First of all, if you're a person with type 2 diabetes, think about your own risk factors. Can you affect significant weight loss? What are the benefits of significant weight loss? There's more than just remission, isn't there, from that? And the expectations. Can we all achieve remission? Think about duration. Think about where the fat is stored. Think about maintenance of weight loss. Because once you've actually achieved remission, the people who've achieved it really want to hold on to it. So you need to be able to manage that. How are you going to do that? So this is not just a quick fix. This is not just a, I'm going to do a 12-week diet, lose a lot of weight, get remission, woohoo, you know, I'm there. It's about what do I do after that for actually manage that process. Is there any way of determining between people, one who will have beta cells, which will restart? And if we had that answer, no. <laughs> no. I mean, you can look at the duration of diabetes, duration of insulin, so you've had type 2 diabetes for a long time, we've been on insulin for a long time, it's less likely, uh, but that doesn't mean that significant weight loss won't improve your glycemic control and actually your glucose control, so you, you may as well try it. You know, what have you got to lose? Um, my illustration here is just about all the things that in the real world get in the way of weight loss. So, you know, you've got the environment around you, you've got the social things going on around you, can you actually afford to change your food? You've got your family who, who likes certain foods, you're, you're delivering this to them. 
you've got family and friends and expectations. Are you mentally able to manage that process of significant weight loss? Physically, am I going to change my activity levels? All gets in the weight loss. And then my final message is actually it's the maintenance phase that's really important. Because you could all you could all go on a starvation diet for a bit. You could achieve remission, but actually long term you need to be able to maintain that. Okay. So we've been on a journey. We looked at the risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Why did we bother? Because they're the same factors that will affect whether or not you can reverse diabetes or put it into remission. We looked at a bit of the evidence around reversing type 2, and all the references are at the end here. And we looked at remission in the real world. So real world, think about it yourself. What's going to affect whether you could potentially put it into remission, or the person next to you, or your friend, your family? You know, if you're a healthcare professional, what's going to affect the person in front of you? Are they going to be able to achieve remission? Really, really shameless plug now. You will have all had a card on your seats, which is to the Future Learn MOOC. This is a free, 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 free course. Um, it's three weeks, it's running currently. And if you miss it, because it, it, it has been running since the middle of, of January, it will run again. But um, basically there's myself and Dr. David Webb who are basically leading this particular MOOC. And it has a lot of these topics on there if you're interested. And like I say, it is free, so please help yourself. These are the references which you can't read up on here. Panic not. If you get the presentation, you'll be able to have a look, have a look at them. And that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you.